Hello? Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today with these amazing group of panelists. I'm Elisa Watanabe. I am a &R director for Ultra Publishing Helix Records. Um, today, we'll be talking about A&R Publishing. I'm um, just going to intro our panelists here real quick. We have Ghazi Shami, who is the CEO of Empire. Um, he's worked with some incredible artists like XXX, Kendrick Lamar, Snoop Dogg, Anderson Pack, um, some people you guys may know. And then uh, Cindy Gu here, who is the head of A&R at Astroworks, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and the regional A&R UMG, who has been working with some incredible uh, regional artists like Mern, Weird Genius, Zamari, and Violet Watier. Um, and then we have David Leuterman, Leuterton here, <laughs> um, who is a partner at Primary Wave and oversees uh, the Asia Pacific um, and has worked with some legendary artists like Sting, um, NXS, and Elton John, Whitney Houston, um, some really big people. So yeah, we have some uh, amazing group here. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to start off this panel as more of a conversational one, um, but chat a little bit about how each of these panelists got into the A&R space. So uh, Ghazi, if you want to kind of tap into that real quick. Uh, I mean, I got into the A&R space making records as a young kid. I started making records um, 14 years old in high school. And then by the time I was in college, I became one of the go-to mix engineers uh, in San Francisco Bay Area where I was raised. And um, being an engineer was like a natural extension of a lot of the artists that were coming into the studio to spend time with me. And next thing I knew, I wasn't just mixing the records, I was arranging them and helping write them. And then next thing I knew, I was bringing in different musicians on sessions and so on and so forth. And then at some point, you just become a resource where people view you as somebody that has uh, access to a lot of things that they need. And I think that the culmination of many things is what makes a great a and to be honest. Absolutely. Do you feel that having that knowledge, that background knowledge in you know, engineering and production has impacted the way that you a and 100%. Yeah, it gives you a different approach. Um, especially in a day and time where there's a cross section where science meets creativity and you're looking at how do you create something and then you're also looking at the opposite end of the pendulum where you're looking at things like Spotify algorithms and uh, YouTube algorithms and I'm a very firm believer in this cross section where the science meets the creativity and oftentimes we'll be in the studio and uh, because of my engineering background, I'll go in and I'll say, that's a three and a half minute record. I don't think most kids around 18 years old want to hear a three and a half minute record anymore. Let's cut the intro so we could jump into the song quicker. Let's drop this hook uh, and turn it into a bridge and maybe chop off the end and, and get this thing down to like 2.30. And uh, maybe we could trick the algorithm into lowering your skip rate. It's essentially the same song, but there's a scientific approach on how to get that song to more listeners and maybe right. bump it up in the algorithm. And, you know, that's, that's the world we live in right now. Absolutely. I definitely want to dive a little bit more into that later on as well, um, the cross-section between science and creativity. Uh, yeah, Cindy, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got into the business. And yeah, in so, yeah, um, I grew up listening to music. I, myself, I have spent 10 years learning classical voice. Um, so, yeah, I, I've been around music since I was a kid. Um, I went to school for music as well. Um, initially started as like classical voice performance major, somehow ended up in music business. Um, but yeah, I started um, in like actually ultra music, um, which is where Elisa is working now. So we kind of swapped labels actually. We worked in very similar companies, so we are friends since We've been then. friends for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, how I got into a and is um, I started um, as business affairs um, team with and drafting a lot of contracts uh, for recording artists and also on the publishing side and dealing with like remix contracts as well. So that's when like I started to learning more about like contracts, publishings, and then all things legal um, related for music. And then I moved to back to Asia. I'm originally from Shanghai. Um, but now I'm based in here in Singapore, um, spending some time uh, doing a and R's now for Southeast Asia region. We're working with a lot of the artists here, um, trying to facilitate that process. Amazing. Yeah, I, I, we've been friends for a while, and it's so cool to see just 
the evolution of everything and you coming to Asia and you know starting out a branch here. So it's very exciting. Um, David, I'd love to hear about you know how you got into the A and R space. Um, so uh, my background is in uh, artist management. So I started as an artist manager. I didn't know that. And we had a label and we had a publishing company at the same time. And so, you know, I learned from a, not an early age, but from the start of my career that everything was about looking after the artist and making sure that we were doing everything possible that we possibly could to promote the interests of our artist. And that flowed into the publishing company that we had, which is an indie publishing company. And we had the same mentality, you know, which was that we had to do everything we possibly could to help these songwriters achieve what they were trying to achieve. Right. Um, so, you know, that indie mentality um, and that artist management mentality is has sort of permeated um, everything that I've been involved in, even when working for major publishers and, you know, different types of companies. That sort of indie mentality I find really important to fall back on um, because, you know, ultimately, um, you know, whether you're a big publisher or a small publisher, um, you have the same responsibility. You know, you, you, you have to be doing everything possible to promote your artist, your writer's career. So that, that's you know, the artist, man, artist management mentality I find really important. Absolutely. No, that's, and that's a perfect segue, actually, into the next question that I have, which is all three of these panelists have experience in both indie versus, you know, the major label system and kind of your experience on both sides and the different, obviously there's, you know, pros and cons to both sides, but also just what your experiences has been like and, you know, that indie mentality, like you said, David, you know, how that has impacted the way that you do business and the way that you work with A&Rs or uh, with artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm by far the oldest person on this stage, so um, I've seen the business change a lot and, um you know, I've worked in major publishers and indie publishers, and you know, look, there are a lot of publishers out there who just think about collecting money, and that's fine if that's what you do. And collecting money is really important, and you know, the songwriter's got to get compensated, and digging out all those dollars is important. But um, I've always found, again, that you know, you got to do both. You you have to find ways of being creative. You have to find ways of investing. Um, as a, as a publisher, whether you're an indie or a major. Uh, and the good publishers do that. You know, good publishers are working hand in hand with labels, they're working hand in hand with promoters, tech companies, whatever, you know, to, uh, as I say, promote the interests of your, of your writer. So the good publishers, both major and indie, do that. Absolutely. I think that's the thing with publishing. It's, you know, a lot of people think that it's just the admin side of things, but there's a whole creative aspect to it that comes into play. Um, Ghazi, I would love to hear a little bit about, you know, your side on the publishing end and kind of your experience and how having creative input or, you know, being part of the creative process for them has impacted their careers. Something that we've done as a company is... Uh we started to realize a lot of the artists that we're working on, the record side of the business, were unpublished. Um, and so we started to call a lot of those artists and say, hey, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, let's get your publishing button down. And then a byproduct of that was that you start to chase the splits, you start to figure out who the producers are, and you start to realize the producers are unpublished too. So we started publishing a lot of the producers, and then the next thing you know, we started doing writing camps and bringing the producers and the artists out to different studios from San Francisco, Atlanta, New York, and uh, just bridging a lot of people that were already living inside of our ecosystem that didn't realize that they had a relationship with one another. Right. And so um, you start to create a lot of synergies. Uh, I'm a firm believer that if you put creative people in a room, the chances of something amazing happening are exponentially greater. So we just started sticking a lot of creative people in a room, doing a lot of writing camps. Uh, we were doing writing camps with our African artists, our hip hop artists, our R&B artists. And uh, next thing you know, a lot, of, a lot of big records started to come out of those sessions. Absolutely. 
I, I feel, I mean, also, as, as I set up a lot of sessions and collaborations, it's such a intentional process of trying to find the right people to go in the right room. It's not just about, you know, finding artists that sound similar or that, you know, could potentially work. It's about personalities. It's about all these different areas that you have to tap into. When it comes to, you know, putting collaborations or sessions together, what is sort of your process? Uh, I mean, we have a pretty robust team on the record side of our company. And uh, they're starting to work pretty closely with the publishing side of the company. I think one of the things that m makes us really successful at it is that there is no delineation. It's all one company. So everybody works across both sides of the company. And so um, a lot of times uh, we do creative A&R meetings every other week where uh, we'll hop on calls and listen to songs and say, this song's a B plus, how do we get it to an A plus? Uh, this producer was really great. How do we bring in another producer to co-produce on the record? How do we bring in some live musicians to maybe redo the string sections or so on and so forth? Um, and then a lot of times that, that energy feeds right back into the studio and a couple weeks later you see the records pop up. So it's really just uh, an all hands on deck mentality and, and allowing, again, empowering creatives to be creative. Absolutely, no, that's a great point. Um, Cindy, I know that you know you also work with publishers, but on the record side, I would love to hear a little bit about you know how that process is and how do you work with publishers? Yeah, definitely, yeah. So as a label, we always obviously want to connect with publishers. Um, on the Astrowork side, we work with um, our direct signings, and oftentimes to clear a track, to release a track, we need to clear the publishing. We need to talk to the publishers of the writer on the track. And for electronic music, oftentimes you would find like, oh, maybe the producer is not necessarily the songwriter. So in that sense, we clear publishing with um, individual publishers or even individual writers. Um, but in terms, for example, my other half of the role when it comes to regional A&R, it's, um, it's more about building a network of publishers. Um, so we, we are quite connected on a local level. A lot of the A&R teams uh, we have here uh, have already built a very robust um, regional network for publishing. And um, of course, UMG also have their also publishing umbrella. Uh, so we don't have to get too deep on that. But I think for myself, what I'm aiming to do is really try to connect with publishers, independent publishers from all over the world, try to you know set up co-writing sessions, uh, get into more like a creative process, connect our regional artists with everyone, like uh, all the writers, creatives from everywhere. So I think that will be like our goal. And we also have like projects where we need to um, release a very specific, um, for example, um, brief on a song, a direction, a sound that we are going for, for a particular artist. When that comes, uh, we will help artists to find top lines, um, co-writing opportunities to build an EP, build an album together. And publishers, partners, they come in very handy in those opportunities. And, and can I say that um, I think that's changed a lot over the last lots of years. Right. Um, you know, when I, f when I first came to the region in the early 90s, that didn't really happen. There was much more of a distinction between labels and publishers. And, you know, publishers were sort of in the corner collecting the money. And I think, you know, that line has sort of blurred a lot. So what you were saying, Ghazi, you know, that... that and it's the same as that indie mentality. There's not really a line there. And I feel like that that's really improved a lot in the region. There's a lot more activity, a lot more creative activity and interaction happening between the labels and the, and the publishers. Yeah, definitely. Like, for example, me, myself, uh, we have a UMPG in the region sitting in the KL office. Uh, normally, from what I understand, UMPG and UMG, we kind of run different business, going after different writers, artists. But I never really experienced that era. Since I started from day one, I've been talking to UMPG almost like every other week or even more constantly on emails. So I think, yeah, definitely creative process-wise, it has changed a lot. Absolutely. No, that's amazing to see the impact of publishing kind of seeping into this region. Um, David, you have a lot of experience with catalog music. so uh, I do. Yes, you do. <laughs> amazing catalog music as well. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I, I've always wondered because, you know, a lot of these, you're dealing with the estates of these families and whatnot. How do you keep the legacy of these artists? Well, I mean, it's, uh, you know, working catalog, um, I, I guess from a mentality, from a principal point of view, it's the same, you know. Um, of course, you're working in a slightly different space. Um, but specifically, to answer your question about estates, we, we do work with estates, Whitney Houston, Prince, Bob Marley, for example. And that's a very special relationship. You know, you have a really distinct responsibility, um, you know, looking after that estate. And we work in partnership always with the estate so that it's always a two-way conversation. We're always, you know, working together about what's the best thing to continue the legacy of that particular artist. And, you know, look, the industry is littered with artists that have passed away and, and, and their legacy has been trashed for whatever reason, whether right. it's just through bad management or bad advice or whatever. Um, so it's really important to, you know, to, um, to really look after those, those, those catalogs and, and respect that legacy because, you know, this music doesn't go away. You know, it's not like Whitney becomes any less relevant uh, or Prince becomes any less relevant. If anything, they become even more relevant. So, you know, it's a really important responsibility. Absolutely, it's incredibly important. Um, this is gonna kind of flip conversations, but I wanted to circle back around to the technology side of things that Ghazi lightly touched on. Um, how do you see the impact of technology, whether it be you know, streaming, social platforms, when it comes to the A&R process? As a publisher or as a record label, <laughs> or both? Both, yes, both. There's massive ramifications. I mean, we're using data and analytics at all times to income forecast, to sign new artists. Uh, we're using new systems like crypto to pay people quicker. Um, it's just, there's ramifications all across the board. You're looking at metaverse, NFT implications, and then from that, how does an NFT break down when it comes to publishing? How do you pay out the mechanical? Um, there's there's not even a system set up for that yet. Exactly, you know, I, right. So uh, there, there's a lot of mostly pluses. There's, you know, there's going to be some pain points along the way and some friction along the way. But uh, technology, I always view technology as an enabler. So for us, it's been... Um, we're very much a software, as, as much a software company as we are a record label and a publisher. I have a deep tech background and a deep affinity for tech, and we've used that to create a very sophisticated supply chain um, and a very sophisticated collection system. Um, and uh, now as a publisher, we're starting to zoom under the radar because we've developed all our own technology over the last few years, and we're unlocking a lot of uh, royalties that have just been laying around for a lot of our artists. So. To me, the technology implications, you know, I think we're still in diapers. So I, I see a massive uh, uptick in the next five to 10 years of how that, you know, what the implications are. Absolutely, and I read recently that you uh, paid in advance via Bitcoin, via Cash App, yeah. uh, to a new artist named Money Man. Please tell us a little bit about, you know, how that process was for you and how you're being proactive in that space, particularly because it's niche and still on the, on the rise. Yeah, so, I mean, something that's very near and dear to my heart is financial literacy and spending a lot of time with our artists teaching them financial literacy. And, uh, you know, there's been generations of haves and have-nots as you go through format changes, right? And much like you've had a format change in the record business where you went from vinyl to tapes, tapes to CDs, CDs to downloads, downloads to streaming, you're having those same uh, format changes in the financial sector, right? Going from fiat currency to checks, checks to credit cards, and then credit cards to payment gateways like you know, uh, PayPal, and then eventually we went to Venmo and Cash App, and then now we're moving into the crypto space and crypto rails, and so, um, Money Man happened to be an artist who's very influential in the urban space where I operate heavily and where I, my roots and background come from. And also happened to be a space where there's a certain lack of financial literacy and transparency. And uh, I believe that 
crypto can correct a lot of that through the blockchain, through the ledger, so on and so forth. And he's put a lot of those undertones in his music. So I felt like he was the perfect person to be an advocate for the technology and where it's headed. So we decided to do a deal with Cash App uh, to do a million dollar transaction in Bitcoin, uh, just to kind of spread the message, um, create a lot of chatter in, in the business. And it, it was very successful. And uh, in the urban community in the United States, Cash App is like the lowest barrier of entry into the new payment systems. Um, and it was, uh, you know, it was very well received. And it, it create again, it just was really just about creating a lot of uh, awareness around the idea that uh, this is a new way to make payments. Um, it, w it was that basic, but that powerful to me. It was Absolutely. a basic but powerful message. Absolutely. No, it's incredibly forward thinking, and I think it's going to start a lot of conversations within the industry as well. And then we, we took the time to implement a lot of that technology into our system, so now we can actually pay USD stable coins pretty much anywhere in the world to an Ethereum wallet. And that'll have a lot of implications on the publishing side because payment gateways are really difficult in certain territories in the world. Like, it's, it's difficult to pay into Southeast Asia in some markets. It's difficult to pay into Africa in some markets. And uh, in many situations, you're chasing uh, uh, individuals to pay them. You know, they're publishing royalties or master royalties. And um, crypto will remove a lot of that friction as it continues to evolve, so. Absolutely, that was very interesting. Um, Cindy, so when it comes to, you know, technology for you, especially with globalization and Southeast Asian territories, and you're seeing Spotify pop up, and you're seeing such a massive market in Indonesia, and they're all coming from the US or other places as well. I'd love to hear kind of about how that's affecting your business when it comes to you know, technology and the access that you have to data now. Yeah, definitely. And also, we're in Singapore, which is probably I think everyone who's into Web3 crypto know that this is the place to be. Um, I obviously is not in that space, but I am always very curious to learn more. And it's very admirable that Empire has done such thing to you know, push the boundaries and sort of pose a question to the industry. How do we move forward from this? Um, these are the questions I feel like technology sort of bring us to. Um, a lot of times, like we don't have the answer right away. Like you, like Gatsi, you said, there will be frictions. We will have to figure it out. Um, just like when we first enter the streaming world, there will be a lot of like legal issues. There will be a lot of like questions that how do we do this, right? But the thing is, like to me, um, technology is like blockchain. Actually, um, it resonates like the ownership of music rights at the very beginning. Um, if you can actually track that would that be easier for people to receive payments? Because every transaction becomes more transparent. Uh, you are able to, you know, allow to track a lot of things. Again, um, I think an expert in the blockchain space will be able to explain more. But for me personally, this is an area I'm interested in. I know um, UMG as a company has explored a lot of partnerships in the, for example, the Web3 NFT space. They've launched, um, like, uh, partnership with platforms like Curio. I have colleagues who are spearheading these um, technology uh, innovation um, projects. So all of that, I think, as an industry, we are all looking at this, and I'm very excited to see what's going to happen next. Absolutely. No. I, I, can I pick up on Please. something that you said, Ghazi, which is that technology is an enabler, and you know, I was there when you know, MP3 started and before the internet came in and when we went from vinyl to CDs and every step of technology change is an improvement and it always creates, you know, some barriers and issues that we've got to debate and sort through, but we get through it and, you know... Get better. Yeah, I mean, we went through we went through the Napster period where, you know, the business got absolutely screwed, but that was just pains that we had to go through to get to streaming and, you know, sort of getting a, a, a new generation of consumers working in a different way. But, you know, each time we've had a new technology, it, it's enabled, you know, new ways of consuming and new opportunities for artists. And Web3 and the metaverse, as someone said, I was in a conference in Nashville a few months ago and someone said, you know, Web3 at the moment is like 1996. 
you know, we're still a few years away from sort of seeing how it all pans out, but we know it's going to be really interesting and, and really empowering. And I think there's some truth in that. You know, we've got a long way to go before we understand what it looks like, but it's going to be super interesting. No, absolutely. That's a great point. And uh, bef right before we wrap up, I wanted to touch on one point was, you know, with technology and just like the access that you have to data and being able to outreach to different people. If you are someone who's looking to tap into this space, into a r or into publishing, what advice would you give someone to someone who's wanting to get into that, into that area, into that department? You mean to get into like data research? Data research and to just publishing in a r as a whole. Uh, from a data research perspective, there's, there's already a lot of platforms out there like chart metric um, and things like that that the average person can just sign up for and start to learn and accumulate knowledge and, and ideas and, and, and see trends and things of that nature. And then obviously you could watch things like the Billboard charts and the Apple Music charts, the Spotify charts, and then you could look at charts in different, different territories of the world and then you can start to form your own judgments about data research. Um, you know, a &R has kind of become segmented into different types of A&Rs, the ones that know how to make records in the studio, the ones that know how to do data research, the ones that maybe know how to source production for different artists and source you know, different resources for artists, the ones that maybe know how to do more of the brand evolution. Um, and then there's the, the brilliant ones that know how to do a cross section of maybe three or four or all those segments. So um, I don't think that there is any replacement for Anything other than just experience. Uh, a and R is so much. So much of it is taste and experience, and evolving your taste and understanding taste and understanding the marketplace and what's trending, what's not trending, or being able to influence trends because you understand where things are headed. But I think a lot of that has to do with taste and culture. Right. And how do you think that the impact of you know? Taste, how is that developed? Is it just the music that you listen to growing up? And do you think that that impacts, you know, because I think a lot of times A&Rs end up in fields that not necessarily are stuff that they listen to. How do you differ differentiate subjectivity with objectivity? Yeah, I mean, some things are about your personal taste and some things are about understanding the, um, the marketplace and understanding your audience. So there's, there's records that I work on where I'm like, I probably wouldn't listen to this, but I understand that there's an audience for it and I understand how to feed that audience. Right. So you might be a clothing designer, you make, make shoes for a living, um, and you might not necessarily wear dress shoes, and you might wear sneakers, so you're, you primarily design sneakers, but if you have to design a line that's complete, you understand the necessity for creating a line of dress shoes because there's a marketplace for it. So, you know, so it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's just having a, you know, a broad perspective on things in that nature, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's Sorry about for studying. the crude analogy. <laughs> no. Yes, it works. <laughs> um, Cindy, I'd love to hear kind of uh, from you, like, just this is more of like a general question, and how would you give advice to someone who wants to get into a and in the region that you're in um, and kind of tap into this space? I actually think the entry barrier is about finding your community, uh, finding the friendship, the mentorship. Um, I actually came to All That Matters seven years ago as a student. Um, from like when I was studying in uni, flew from New York, uh, took a one week off from classes, just came here and tried to meet as many people as possible. And um, it was very lucky that I made my way here, moved here eventually, and started to find more friends, a lot of mentors, of course, um, a lot of people here in the audience. Um, they are now familiar faces and also friends in the industry. So I think a lot of it, it's the community you find for yourself, for your artists. Um, even for artists, I feel like uh, friendship is so important when it comes to collaborations. Um, and also, again, I think for me, it's more like try to um, stay curious, um, keep, up, keep up to date with technologies, um, try to talk to more people, yeah. Amazing, thank you. And then, yeah, just to wrap it up, David, I'd love to hear a few ideas from your side of, your, you know, with your, all your experience, kind of how you would suggest anyone who's trying to get into this, how, what's the breaking point, what's the entry that you would be able to advise on? Um, look, I... Yeah. Again, I, I go back to how I came into the business. You know, it was it's just passion. 
You know, you want to be involved in music. You want to work with artists. You want to, if you're not an artist yourself, I'm not, an, I'm not a musician or an artist, but I always wanted to help empower artists uh, in whatever way I could. And, and for me, it was through artist management at first, but, you know, you find your way through different parts of the business. So, you know, I've got a son who wants to get into the music business, and he asks me the same question. It's like, just do it. Just find the music you love, find the tribe you love, just do it, you know, and you'll make mistakes, um, but just get into it. And I think there's so many tools now. I was, we were talking before, you know, in back in those days, the only way to get into the business was you had to get a record deal. Now there's so many other avenues for artists to, you know, make their music and get it out to communities, build tribes, build, you know, communities of fans that was, was never there before. So the opportunities are so much wider. It makes it more complex. Uh, and, and sometimes it makes it harder. You know, the, you, there's a lot of competition. But um, I think net-net, we're in a much better place than we were. Uh, and I think for, you know, for young kids coming in, there's so much opportunity. Just find, you know, find the direction that really turns you on and that you have a passion for and just go for it. Amazing. That's a great place to wrap. Just do it. I agree with that. I'm in full grants. You have to love the music at the end of the day. So all the reason why we're in this business. Um, please give an amazing round of applause to these great panelists here today.